Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, February 9th, 2022 meeting of the Chappaqua Central School District Board of Education. The board has been in executive session since six o'clock. Um, could I have a motion please to re-enter the public meeting? I move. All in favor? Aye. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. So we're going to start this evening. Would you like me to begin? Sure. Okay, so um, welcome to our board meeting. We have two very special presentations before we move into the Greeley uh, building presentation for the night. So I'd like to invite our interim director of special education, Assistant Superintendent Jamie Edelman, to introduce our first guest. I am so excited to introduce Josiah Clarkson to you. Josiah is a student at the Walden School, and he has been designated their student of distinction. I went to meet Josiah at his school on Monday, and I know why he was selected for this honor. He is adorable and smart and friendly and outgoing and a very hard worker. The other thing that his teacher said is that he's a really good friend to the other students in his class. So we're going to start with a short video that was put together by his school. And then Josiah is going to join us for a few minutes via Zoom. I told him that the board might ask him a few questions, maybe about what he likes about school or what he likes to do outside of school. So if you have questions for him, please feel free to ask. Good evening. It is with great pleasure that I join you to announce this month's recipient of the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES Student of Distinction Award. This significant achievement is for students recognized by our staff for outstanding performance and personal growth. I also want to take a moment to thank you for your continued support. We value our relationship with your school district and look forward to continuing to serve your needs. And now for the Student of Distinction Award. Hello, I'm Matthew Tucker, principal of the Walden School at PNW BOCES. I am delighted to announce that Josiah Clarkson of the Chappaqua Central School District has been named our Student of Distinction for the month of February. Josiah started in Walden in late November last year and he immediately made an impression. From day one, he was respectful and responsible. He learned our routine quickly and can be relied on to put forth his best effort. With the support of his amazing teachers and staff here at Walden, we are watching Josiah forge his own pathway to success. Congratulations, Josiah. Okay, so now we're just going to wait for Josiah and his mom to come up on the Zoom. Hi. Hi. We lost you. Can you bring him back up? He's not on the... Can you see us, Josiah? We can't see you. Mm -hmm. Say yes. Yeah. Okay, we heard your mom coaching you. We heard your mom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dr. Ackerman. I'm the superintendent. Hi. Hi. In, your, in your house, congratulations. I'm winning your award. Where are you? I'm, a, I'm, a not, I'm in Horace Gurley High School. Are you? Where are you? <laughs> I, I can't see your desk. Oh, all right. Can you hear our voices? Because we're going to ask you some questions. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. First of all, we're really proud to have you with us today. Um, Mrs. Edelman shared with me that she had visited you at school and everyone at your school said such wonderful things about you, how smart you are, how hard you work, how kind you are. And that's just great. So great for us to hear that. And I'm here with the Board of Education, and they oversee the entire school district. They're in charge of everybody. And we want to spend a few minutes just learning from you this evening about your experience at school. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Brasso, our president. Is it okay? 
Hi, Josiah. First of all, I want to say congratulations. That's an incredible achievement. And we're all super proud of you. Thank you. And I'd love to know, what is your favorite thing about the Walden School? My favorite thing about Walden School is that I get friends now. That's great. I get friends now. I only get real friends. We're like real friends. Because the oldest friends in kindergarten, they, they don't even talk. Some of them don't even talk to me. What's the point of talking to people that don't even talk back? So, just, uh, congratulations. And I have a quick question. Thank you. What, what's your favorite thing about school to learn? To learn? Math. So what's your favorite subject, math? Yeah. That's great. Kelly, do you? All stars for math. Congratulations. Am I allowed to ask what's your least favorite thing to learn? <laughs> I like really like I really like I really like oh wait what's the okay. what's your least favorite I know it's what's the book no, read the, aloud I really least, like read aloud when someone reads stuff to me she said what's the least thing the read aloud like the less the what, less yes what do you like you really don't like to do I really don't like to do yeah. is when we make a project and we have to show it. Like, well, like when I show my toys, I really like to get embarrassed. I really want oh. to, I don't no, really what, like to stand in front of the class. Okay, okay. there you go. <laughs> I, that's just embarrassed me. I don't like to stand in front of the class and everyone is just watching me. Or I have to show I something. that way too, even yeah. right now. Kind of shy. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I am. Congratulations, Josiah. Like you seem so happy at your school, which is just I am. makes all I am. smile so much. And um, I want to know if you get to do go outside and have other activities outside of the stuff in the classroom that yeah. you really like to we do. We went outside for recess. Good. And is there something you like to play at recess? Yeah. What do you tag. like? To play? Tag. 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 Tag is awesome. Well, we hear you're, they, they said that you're a great friend to all your new friends at school. So I really I want am. To you on that. That's actually that's, right. I am. That's fantastic. And congratulations. Yay. All right. On the last one, I just wanted to say congratulations. And what do you like to do after school? After school. I've never heard of after school. Uh, after school, I really like to play Roblox with sister and watch TikTok and watch TV. <laughs> All good things. I'll play with my toys. I don't know. So, Josiah, can you take? I don't know who's controlling the camera, but can you? Put my mom. Up? Okay, She's let holding me, let me, it. I'll hold it for. Her. She is. Let me see your mom. All Congratulations! Hi. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting Josiah go to school with us. And Josiah, we're really proud of you. So, thanks for joining yeah. us tonight. Congratulations. Awesome. Amazing. Okay, so we give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great yeah. night. Gonna go to bed. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. Bye. 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 See you later. <laughs> wow, that was wild. Okay, Mr. Cresselia, I don't know how you're gonna top that, but come on up <laughs> to introduce Anika. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so, um, no, I'm not going to try to top that, but I'm really happy to be here to uh, welcome and celebrate and acknowledge Anika Puri, who's Yay, one of the yeah. students. Could you come Woo! on up here, please? So I know some of you um, know Anika, and if you don't know Anika, I just have to say, she is just the most amazing student academically, personally. She's curious. She's intellectual. She's kind. She's never, I'm sure she has bad days, but I've never seen her have a bad day. She is always just an incredible uh, bright light at the school. And so we're here because of her efforts in science research. So she was named this year's one of this year's 2022 a science, a Regeneron STS scholar. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what that is. And I know you've heard about it before because I've mentioned it. I think I've got a piece of paper here about it. Uh-oh, hang on a second. 
I want to have the, all of the information here. Oh, and I actually don't think I have it, so I'm going to have to We're do it products. from. I have to do it from memory, which is amazing. So I will say the Regeneron STS Science Competition is the most competitive and rigorous and um, prestigious science competition for high school seniors. It is an incredible honor. So over, um, over, I think it was over six thousand. Uh, no, sorry, um, over six. I think it was maybe six thousand entrants. There's, I'm going to have to check that number later. 300 were selected to be Regeneron scholars. For that, uh, she, is, she has been given this honor because of her academic excellence, her ability to do incredible research, and to give her the, sort of the, the position and standpoint to show off her research, and she was able to present for that. She also, as part of this, has won the school $2,000 for our science research uh, 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 program, which is just amazing to us. And the, the winners from this, or the applicants for the Regeneron Science, it's, it's a Nash, it comes from 46 states, it comes from several different countries, and um, it is, a, is a truly an international competition, and it is no small feat for her to be honored this way, and we are just so incredibly proud of her. Now, so we can clap about that, that's awesome. Yeah, I had the opportunity coming into one of her science research classes several weeks ago and happened to talk to Anika about what she was studying. She pulled open her laptop, she showed me some amazing things, but I want her to give you a little bit of an explanation, which she's been doing for quite a long time, uh, about her project and what she's been researching. If you want to go ahead, please. Awesome. So, thank you so much. Um, so I guess a brief description of my research is first kind of like what the problem is. So over 60% of the entire elephant population disappeared in just the last decade. And this problem is similar for other species as well, who are facing a similar biodiversity crisis. And so, as you can imagine, wildlife poaching has become a problem that has reached epidemic proportions. And so, my research works to solve this issue by developing a new first-of-its-kind software and hardware. So, the scientific basis of my research lies in movement patterns. Now, as you can imagine, the movement patterns of elephants and humans vary significantly with respect to their speed and turning patterns. And so what I realized is that you can harness this difference by essentially differentiating between the elephant and the human with these spatial temporal patterns. And so in my research, I developed an algorithm that analyzes these movement patterns or spatial temporal patterns to increase the accuracy in identifying potential poachers in real-time thermal videos taken from drones. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, I, so I walk into the science research class, and she opens up, and there's drone footage, night drone footage um, on safari with elephants and poachers walking around, and I'm like, it's just incredible, incredible work. Also want to tell you before you have to answer your questions for her, that just this last Saturday, she won first place in engineering at the JSHS competition. She's headed on to states, and uh, I think it's in March, right, yeah. for, for the state competition. It's just amazing. So congratulations. Thank you. That's incredible. First of all, congratulations. <laughs> I'm amazed at what you were able to create in terms of the actual, not only the algorithm and the actual hardware to do this, but your ability to see a problem, say, how do we solve this problem and what do we need to, to develop to solve this problem? And then to, to see through that whole process is exceptional and inspiring. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm curious sort of what, what it was about this particular issue that spoke to you, and did you get to meet any actual elephants doing your research? And if not, how do you make sure you get to meet them in the future? Yes, so unfortunately, I did not get to meet an actual elephant, unfortunately. But hopefully after COVID, I'll get to travel to Africa and you know meet some elephants. But um, I have always really been interested in wildlife poaching, and we were actually on a visit to India, and I would, like poaching has technically been illegal. So I was a little bit confused when, you know, we were in a market and we saw a bunch of ivory, you know, jewelry and statues. And that's when I kind of like came to, you know, kind of research this a little bit more as to, you know, what if it is illegal, how come it still is such a huge problem? And that's, I guess, kind of what really got me started into like looking more into wildlife poaching. 
Congr congratulations. Thank you. Um, my, I only have one question. What do you want to do next? What's your next steps? Um, I'm really passionate about engineering and I guess like the interdisciplinary aspect of it, kind of seeing how can it be applied to other areas. I think it'd be really cool to look into the intersection of engineering, artificial intelligence, and biology. Mm -hmm. And so kind of looking at things like, you know, biological de and medical devices and like prosthetics. So, yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. We look, we look forward to what you create in the future for us. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Congratulations. Hi. Can I Thank just you. ask what was your biggest challenge? I ask about the challenges and the things that kids don't like because I think you can learn from yeah. the things you don't like and the challenges that you face. Yeah, definitely. I think, I guess in terms of my research, so I talked a little bit about these movement patterns, right? And so we were essentially extracting a bunch of different spatial temporal patterns. And so this is a little bit sort of like technical looking at dynamic time warping. And so when I, in my algorithm, currently, when you're measuring the distances, we're using the Euclidean, Euclidean distance, the series would have to be exactly the same length for them to measure the similarity between them. But when I was measuring the movement patterns, kind of like the elephant and the human, they move at different speeds. So the kind of length of them are gonna be very different. And so what I had to do from this is I kind of explored a little bit, you know, what sort of algorithms could I use to be able to sort of, you know, measure the similarity. And that's kind of how I came across dynamic time warping. So I was able to kind of learn from that and actually kind of you know, learn how to actually program this sort of stuff, so. Wow. Nick, that, we're, we're so thrilled for you and um, you. It, it's really an incredible accomplishment. And I, I see you up here as a high school student, <laughs> very poised, very articulate, very Thank comfortable you. talking to a group of people, which is not the case for a lot of <laughs> students. So. I'm curious whether you were always comfortable in this position or um, whether you had to practice. Um, you know, you don't seem shy, but I know a lot of students, like, they, they really work on it. So was that at all a challenge for you? Were you always comfortable speaking and, and talking about your research? Um, I guess I, this is a big thank you to Dr. Papernick. She really taught us a lot about presentation skills and, you know, practicing in front of, like, you know, peers, other teachers. And she really helped us sort of, like, you know, how do you kind of like, you know, kind of with that poise and confidence with your research? And I think, especially when I was younger, I think I kind of went through this development almost where when I was younger, I sort of blabbered a lot. So I just like spoke without thinking. <laughs> and then it's like when I kind of grew older, it's like I sort of reeled it back in and then I thought too much. So now it's like, you know, it's kind of like, what do I say? What do I not say? And then as you grow older, it's sort of like, you know, you realize you sort of think and then you speak at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like this sort of like evolution. Well, it all came together today. very nicely. So, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> well, congratulations like everybody else. Thank Have you, you thought about other applications for the algorithm other than elephants? And if so, what are those? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of other animals like, you know, Ryan knows they're facing a similar biodiversity crisis. And the Birds AI data set that I used actually has movement patterns for other animals as well, kind of like rhinos. So one of the steps that I really want to kind of go into is kind of applying this algorithm to other animals. So, yeah. Congratulations, congratulations to you and your family. Congratulations you. to you and congratulations to your family. This is really an incredible accomplishment. Thank you, Anika. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Oh, yeah, take a picture. David, can you take a picture of Anika on the stage yeah. with Mr. Crusilia and her teachers? Yeah, and could we invite up, yeah, Lisa yeah. Papernick, her science research sure. teacher, and can I invite up her parents, too, for a picture? Oh, yeah, come yeah, on yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, please, please, come on up. I mean... <laughs> take a picture, commemorate this. Come on up, please. Where do you want Okay, and now we're going to transition to our high school presentation. So um, for the community watching, a, a lot of the uh, members of the audience are familiar guests. Uh, every meeting for the first part of the year, we highlight one of our buildings and we're at our final presentation. And 
I'm pleased to introduce again Mr. Cresilia, who will be um, working with our math team to highlight our math program. And then we will be transitioning into our, our guidance presentation. So, Mr. Cresilia? Thanks. Thanks. I'll we keep go going again. here. Yep. So, uh, I'm also really happy here to uh, welcome up our, our math department and some of our students, some of our teachers and students, to share with a little bit about what's happening in the math classroom, to ask you to play a little bit with math. We're actually going to ask you to, to do that a little bit on stage. I know that might raise some anxiety level, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I know it. And uh, we have some whiteboards, and it'll be great. I want to introduce you to introduce the, uh, the presentation, Glenn Wong, our department chair of math. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the math department, I'd like to thank you for having us here tonight so that we can share a little bit of our work that we've been doing on building thinking classrooms, which we like to refer to as BTC. Um, with me here tonight to help in the presentation, we have three of my math colleagues. We have Jesse Wren, Nick Clare, and Caitlin Plate, all of whom you'll meet later. And we've also asked three students here, come on up, um, so that they could share their perspectives. And I'd just like them to come up to introduce themselves real quickly. Hello, my name is Ian Cressman. Hi, my name is Lucas Duran. Um, my name is Elizabeth Shu. Thank you for coming. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So our exploration into BTC began over the summer when several math teachers read Dr. Peter Lilljaw's book, Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics. And the teaching strategies and, um, and principles outlined by Dr. Liljal um, acted really as the inspiration for us um, to think about how we could move our classrooms forward and what work we could do to more fully engage our students in their own learning. And this really expands to a whole different set of arenas, such as how do we use classroom space um, how do we ask students to show and display their work? What is the role of the teacher in the classroom? Um, and what is the role of direct instruction in every class? Um, and this shift in our practice was intentional um, as we sought to find more ways to fully engage our students in their learning. What this looks like from classroom to classroom and from teacher to teacher differs because the different elements of Dr. Liljal's work resonated differently with each of us. And it's also looked different over time from September to now, and we expect that it will continue to look different as we continue to learn more and evolve in our understanding of BTC. Um, much of that learning is happening through our learning team right now, uh, consisting of high school math teachers, middle school math teachers, and we actually have some special ed colleagues also joining us in that learning team. We're also very fortunate to have the support of our staff developers, Mr. Josh Colwell Block, Dr. Adam Pease, and of course our Greeley team of administrators and all the staff developers. So one of the guiding principles of BTC is experience first, formalize later. And so in the spirit of BTC, we're gonna ask for your help as we move to a thinking task, which Mrs. Plate will set up. Hi everybody, I'm Caitlin Plate. I know Glenn introduced me, but um, I'm one of the math teachers at Greeley. So some of you might have noticed a playing card on your desks. If you have a playing card at your table, we're gonna ask that you look for a whiteboard as soon as they're set up that has the same number as your card. You're either gonna be an ace or a two or a three. And so find the board with your same card number. And you will have a student at your board as well. Yeah, it could be a different suit. That's fine. Just the same uh, ace, two, or three. OK, so I'm going to do this the true thinking classroom style, which is delivering the task out loud to you. So here's what you're gonna be asked to do. I'm going to give you four numbers. Your job is to take those four numbers and combine them in some way so that the answer is the number one. I also want you to combine them to get the number two, three, and every number up to 10. 
So you have your four numbers. You could use any mathematical operation that you want, but you've got to get it to equal one, two, three, and every integer up to 10. Your numbers are one, two, five, and six. Really? I tested the math. Yep, one, two, five, and six. I'm going to ask you to sort of step to the side of your board, but position yourself so that you can see the other board. So like move around. You have this full use of the stage here. Move around so you can see the boards. If, uh, Lucas, maybe your group could just like turn your board a little bit so that people could see. So I, I noticed that you noticed something. Say it louder. What did you notice? What did your group do that some groups maybe didn't do? Okay. We, we use every number in every equation. Okay. No, I think I think you did. You you the way that you showed your thinking is a little bit maybe different than how the other groups did. But I I you were using all the numbers. I noticed that this group decided to go in order, right? You had this strategy: let's get one, let's get two, let's get three. Does anyone from one of the other groups want to speak to sort of like a strategy that they used that was maybe different than that?
So you, I'm just going to repeat it on the mic because what you said was great, but I don't know if everyone could hear. So you notice, oh, we saw some patterns, we saw some numbers that we could get. We didn't have to go in order. Very cool. Um, I'm going to ask people to return to their tables. We're going to wheel these whiteboards to the side. Thank you for participating in that. Nobody got seven? I wonder if it's possible. We'll come back later and check. Thank you for that low stakes exercise. I was a little nervous about that. Luckily, our students led the way there. So thank you for that design. Hi, I'm Jesse Wren, and I'm going to give you a quick peek into one of our math classrooms right now in this video. All right, and now we're going to share some of the experiences with you that our students have had this year. Um, so let's start with, what did you notice first when you walked into your classroom, and how did that shape the, your expectations for our math this year? Um, so one of the first things I noticed when I walked into a classroom was that the desks were arranged in groups of only three, as opposed to larger tables or individual seating. And that sort of led me to believe that this was going to be a type of environment where we would have a lot of opportunities to share ideas with our group members. Because each group was fairly small, meaning that it would be easy to engage with each other and work together. And another main thing that I noticed when I first walked in was that there were chalkboards and whiteboards and BenQ boards on almost every single wall in the room. And this also sort of made me wonder if this was going to be a really, a class that really focused on hands-on work as opposed to solely sticking to paper and online assignments. And that really made me look forward to this class because a collaborative environment and an interactive environment is pretty rare these days and it's not something that I see among the rest of my Thank you. Could you speak to why it's important that our classrooms don't have the distinct front? Yeah, so one of the things you'll also notice when walking into our classrooms is that it's not uh, like a traditional classroom in the sense that um, wherever you look, there's something going on. And um, as we said before, there's a board kind of on every side of the room. And the reason why that's important is mainly because of uh, classroom engagement. In your traditional classroom, um, students who sit at the front of the classroom might be at a sort of advantage as they are in closer proximity to a teacher. Uh, and kids in the back might get more easily distracted or might find it hard to focus um, on the content being taught. Whereas if there's no distinct front in the classroom, everyone has a sort of equal opportunity and equal proximity to a teacher and everyone's sort of included and engaged in the work going on all around them. Thank you. And then how do you move around the classroom during a lesson and how does that shape the way you think about math and work on math? Yeah, so um, we usually start off um, each class kind of doing a do now at our seats or, um, you know, reviewing homework of some sort. But a lot of the class is then kind of uh, focused around, um, as we kind of mentioned before, and as you saw in the slideshow, um, really getting up and, and working with our peers at the boards. Um, and I think this is something kind of really special, uh, just because, you know, the ability to, you know, be able to um, get up and have that freedom uh, to be able to pace around, or, you know, sometimes we're walking around the room kind of looking at different boards, um, really allows us, you know, um, you know, Lucas and Elizabeth have said before, really allows for more kind of engagement. Um, and I think it just makes the class overall, you know, something more interesting, something that's a little more exciting to look forward to um, than your kind of typical math class where you're sitting down for most of the class. Thank you, Mr. Clare. Hi, I'm Nick Clare. 
I'm going to give you a little bit, uh, another quick video on some sights and sounds of, of a math class. Right so a couple of things that were mentioned before, um, one of the things that was mentioned was about writing um, on the boards in the whole classroom. So can you speak to what the benefits are of the whole class writing at the same time on those boards? Um, yeah, so I could say a bit about that. Um, one of the biggest things I find that serves in this, as uh, an advantage of the whole class working on the problem on their boards is that element of collaboration that you can get. Um, we saw in our little kickoff activity that we did that we actually um, a lot of us utilized each other. And that's a perfect example of what happens in the classroom almost every day where people are doing these problems on the board um, and we're fearless in that we kind of go across. And as Ian said, we kind of move around the room, circulate different ideas because everyone's kind of working on the same problem. And it makes it easier to pinpoint things we're doing right and things that we can maybe improve on our own ideas from others. Yeah, to add on to that a little bit, um, I think it's, it's really important to kind of, you know, everyone has, comes into the class with the different ideas and different kind of mindset in terms of math. Um, and so, especially in a class where, you know, every, it's a kind of a lot of self-guidance and we're kind of figuring out the methods of solution. Um, it's really important that, you know, we have other, other people we can use kind of as resources. Um, and when everyone's up at the board and you're constantly, you know, communicating, um, with your peers and listening to their ideas, um, it can, you know, really help you, especially, you know, you might not be getting, um, you know, how to solve it, you know, every single time, at, you know, at first, um, but you can really use um, your, your classmates as resources um, and kind of funnel their ideas into your own mind until something really clicks. And I think that is really helpful um, in this type of um, classroom. Thanks. Uh, so who do you typically work with and uh, what's that like? Um, so typically, I actually work with different people almost every math class because the way we're seated is completely random. Before class starts, we're handed cards to choose from, which determines where we sit for the rest of the period. And compared to working with even your close friends all the time, I actually think this is really refreshing and enjoyable for a change because it means you're constantly exposed to new problem-solving techniques or methods or strategies that you might not have the opportunity to pick up on if you sit with the same people every day. So overall, it really just broadens your thinking and makes you look at problems from a different perspective. Thanks. How, how do you feel your contributions shape the class's learning? Um, so obviously, um, you know, you've, you've seen all of us talk about, you've seen the classrooms. Um, we're all working pretty much constantly um, in groups, and especially because our groups are only made up of, you know, two, three, four people, um, we're really relying on one another for ideas and for support. Um, so in that way, we're all kind of contributing uh, to our group, and then eventually the class as a whole, and when we kind of come back together. Um, and I think compared to kind of a more traditional math classroom where you're all kind of sitting at your desks, um, there's a lot more contribution um, in this class, uh, in this type of classroom, because, you know, instead of raising your hand only maybe two or three times maximum, you're, you know, participating and being a part of the learning process and, you know, um, contributing to the discussion with other people, um, you know, every single moment um, in the class. So, thank you. And how does the class transition from the group problem solving to a whole class synthesis? So... Um, transitioning from the group problem solving to a full class uh, synthesis happens in a number of ways. Um, the two most common ones that we see in class, uh, sometimes a group will be doing something on the board and they'll kind of nail the concept and their work will be, um, their work will be so detailed and so, um, so closely related to the concept that the teacher will stop the class and maybe direct the class's focus to that one board. But the more interesting case and the one um, that I really like more is when uh, kind of the whole class is stumped on a problem. There is some times in class that we look at all the boards and no one has really come to a final answer. But what's so great about that is that it kind of builds into a full class synthesis because um, 
the way the classroom is formatted and as we were talking about how the teacher could circulate around the room, um, the teacher can point out different things that are on different elements that are on different boards that and can pinpoint the good and the bad um, in different examples. Essentially, you'll have nine to ten different examples all around the room and you could use all of those examples and elements from all those examples to build um, a common understanding or synthesize those ideas. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you're all so amazing. You can, you can have a seat. You're amazing. Thank you so much. I think the board will probably want to ask for students questions. Oh, yeah. They're just going to okay. sit right here, and all then right. I'll be done in like a minute. So this is a quick little video of actually me and one of my classes doing a little whole class synthesis at the end. So today we started our presentation with what we would call a non-curricular task, but of course in our math classrooms we're focused on content and we're really carefully choosing curricular tasks that are going to help tell this big story that we're trying to tell. And the idea is building the content through problem solving. While the students are working, the teacher has the privilege of looking around the room, seeing all the amazing ideas emerge, deciding, do I need to give a hint? Should I offer an extension? Is there some kind of seed that I like to plant so that an idea can grow that I'm hoping to see develop? And so while all that's going on, we're looking around and seeing, I'm going to first direct the class over here to look at this little cookie crumb and then we're going to head over here to this group's work and really using all the student contributions as a starting point to tell the narrative that we're hoping to tell. Um, I'm going to have the students come back up so the board can ask some questions. So I'll jump in and start. Um, thank you. This was a great presentation and it was great to be engaged in it. And it's really cool to see how math is evolving in terms of how it's being taught and how it's being implemented in the classrooms. And I will say this looks a lot more fun than my high school math experience. Um, but I actually have a question for the teachers who are, who are teaching this day in and day out. And my question is this. This is obviously very engaging and a great way um, for students to be involved in the curriculum and, and learn it. I guess my, my question is how do you monitor for the students who aren't getting it, um, especially when if you're working in groups with your peers, it may be embarrassing for a student to be like, no, no, I really have no idea what's going on here or I really miss that concept. How do you as, as teachers sort of keep tabs on whether there are students who, who aren't getting it and how do you help them in this environment? I think if you come into the classroom, you'll see that we're all very active and we're constantly circulating through the room. And we're also relying on the students to look around the room as many of you did and really help each other out. And so there are definitely moments where I will approach a group and I'll question them and probe them for their understanding. And I'm, I'm consistently taking these small assessments as I circulate through the room. I just wanna add, there's also opportunities for students to check their own individual understanding separate from the group work. So they definitely have those times where they get to do self-assessment and we get to also see their individual work. It's not just completely always working collaboratively. There's definitely individual checks. Okay, great, thank you. So a, are you guys all in the same class or different classes? No, we, yeah, we're all in different classes. Okay, and what level do, are you doing this? Is this in every class of math? What, what classes are you guys what, in? Yeah, what, if you could talk about that. Or, or maybe Mr. Wong. <laughs> Uh, sure, yeah. So I'm in um, Enriched Algebra 2 and Trig. Yeah, I'm in Math 10 Honors. Um, I'm in Math 9 Honors. <laughs> uh, we've also seen this work, however, in our Essentials of Algebra, our Cornerstone of Algebra, our Geometry, uh, AP Calculus, AP Statistics. Um, it's really so, so a wide you, range. So it's across the board, all levels, all... all uh, it ages. is. Great, it, it's you. a varying degrees. So, I mean, when we, years ago, when we started the iLab, we looked at this whole idea of co concept of open spaces and learning and interactive learning, and it seemed like initially it was all, not all, 
mostly the humanities, like social studies, English, arts, that, those type of subjects that we're doing it. But to see this actually happening in a math class where there's traditionally, you know, the Horace Mann rows and columns of students sitting there watching a teacher lecture, this is just refreshing because we spend a lot of time and energy, at least the faculty did, the administration did, to build this model in our schools and to see these three students standing up here and explaining to us what they were doing through this, to me, it's it sort of, it, it really, it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see the money that we spent and the energy that we spent on this that just expanded throughout the entire curriculum in the school. So thank you very much for the students and for the math department for taking this on, not re remaining just very static and, you know, the way you, you were doing things that you really opened, opened up to this concept. It's great. I wish this, as Hillary said, I wish this was there when I was a math student because I probably could have used this. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so I have a question. So how do you decide, um, it's for really more for the teachers, how do you decide, you said you do individual work as well as the group work, is it like, you know, in the humanities where you have the mini lesson and then you go off and you do your work, or do you start off by doing the work and then come back and then, you know, do your own thing, or, um, and how do you decide that, and what's the ratio, do you depend on what topic it is, what unit you're studying? Um, yeah, I kind of think you hit the nail on the head there a little bit, how it, it kind of does vary depending on topic to topic and um, what, uh, like kind of how Ms. Plate said before, how the narrative that we're trying to pull out or the story that's trying to be told, we're trying to like carefully design an activity that's going to like bring those thoughts out of the students. So we're designing something that that's going to happen. And, and sometimes, like you said, it starts with a mini lesson and then they break up into the groups and then individual work. Sometimes it starts with individual work. It really does vary, vary um, topic to topic. So it's mostly that individual teacher's choice. It's not something that's set across the board. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much. No, this is great. And, and I, I agree with what Warren said. It's really nice to see this kind of collaboration and these um, group and team activities move into math, which um, and I, I do think it, I mean, I've always loved math, but I, this makes it more fun. And, you know, I guess for the students, does it, um, did it change your feelings about yourself as a math student? You know, um, did, did you find your, your joy of learning increase? Are there times where you really need to, that you find that you love the collaboration, but you also need to sit down and say, wait, wait, I gotta, I gotta clear out the noise and I need to focus and make sure that I'm understanding this. What's that balance like for you guys? Um, so I could speak to that a little bit. Um, I would say that this style of learning definitely increased, um, I guess the best way to put it is increase my confidence mm -hmm. in my uh, math skills because I know a lot of other, a lot of my peers also have a problem where if we're doing individual work, uh, we might not be so comfortable sharing our ideas and our methods because um, we're in fear of getting the problems wrong or not mm -hmm. doing it in sort of a correct way. But this, this free um, collaboration and the way the classroom is set up makes it so that um, everyone is really included in finding these methods and everyone's on the same page. And it really, it really has made my experience a lot better uh, because I feel like I could just branch out more and share my ideas more fearlessly in class. That's great. Yeah, and I, can, I can add on a little bit. Um, I think for me, one of the, the really cool things about math is that, um, in a sense, we're using pretty much only our like, prior knowledge um, to then develop understanding of a, of a new topic. Um, and I think that really, in and of itself, increased kind of my interest in, in math and, and subject as a whole, um, because it kind of offered a new perspective as opposed to just kind of a teacher. Um, you know, going on about a subject at the board, you really feel as if, you know, you were almost there. Um, it, it, you're kind of experiencing something that, you know, the person who initially um, founded the principal might have experienced in that sense. You're um, kind of discovering something for yourself, and I think that is, you know, really something fun and interesting that I find about math. That's great. So it seems like you're using this more as a building block as opposed to being handed a new concept exactly. that you're seeing it from the, from the ground up and yeah. how, okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. This is kind of adding on to what Lucas said before, yeah. but overall this kind of like learning environment has made my like leadership skills stronger in oh, a great. way. 
-hmm. because since we're working as a in groups all mm -hmm. the time it, it kind of teaches you how to take charge of a situation or to help your peers if mm -hmm. they're in trouble and overall it does increase your confidence that's fantastic thank you so much this is great yeah this is great I, again i do wish i had learned that this way i might not be counting the sweats when i see it <laughs> <laughs> on the board you did great <laughs> um so as teachers how have you felt kind of letting go of the reins and stepping back from that teacher-centric classroom where you are the keeper and gatekeeper of all information and all knowledge and they're reliant on you for that. How has that been for you guys as teachers to you know, evolve through this, to be comfortable enough to let them you know, struggle it out a little bit? Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. I think that was an anxiety for yeah. me at the beginning was um, how do I move the locus of control more to my students? And at the same time, that was the thing that was most exciting to me. And to see them pick it up and, and run with it has been so gratifying. And I think in seeing that, I just want to do it more. It's, it's like the more that I can allow them to, to have those feelings that they're talking about, um, the more I want to do it. So yes, there's definitely an anxiety there about how much that I can hand over, but Seeing them step up has been so gratifying. Thank you. Okay. Let's see the math anxiety shift. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, so, on behalf of the administration and, and the board this evening, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our math department yeah. for sharing with us your good work and your expertise. And we really appreciate uh, you spending the evening with us. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So, come for your Excellent. photo op. Excellent. Oh, yeah, come up to the stage for your photo op. Yeah, center stage. And then, Rebecca, we're going to invite you to come up and sit up here with us. Yes, we are. Andrew, we're, we're going to have you sit over here. No problem. Okay. All right. So, Andrew. Yeah. Go ahead. Here. I'm happy Introduce to introduce Rebecca. And Is this on? Do I, do I have to hit a little button? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. All right. Well, um, so now we're transitioning to the last part of the, uh, the high school piece tonight which is, I've got, uh, I'm happy to introduce Rebecca Mullen, who is our chairperson of our counseling department, who's joining me here to talk to you a little bit about some of the work in counseling. Um, if you remember, PCG in, uh, was you know, contracted in, uh, in 2020 to review our counseling department. They did so. They made some um, really strong recommendations for us and some work uh, we've undertaken to uh, integrate some of those recommendations into the work currently and ongoing, and we wanted to uh, share some of that with you. So I'm going to See if I can control this and there we go. So remember it was January of 2020 um, when, when they uh, came in to conduct a review, they analyzed data and documents, did focus groups, interviews, did surveys, and um, came up with some recommendations organized, oops, organized under some uh, broad themes. And one of the broad themes that came up was the organization structure of the department, taking a look at asking the question, how do our systems help to support our students? And so we're just going to highlight some of, you know, this is one of the, I think, most exciting changes to come out of the review around organization and structure, which is, um, if you remember and you know, it's eight counselors, three school psychologists, a social worker, student assistance counselor. There's everybody. <laughs> and here, oops, one of the recommendations was changing the way that we align caseloads between assistant principals and counselors. So you can imagine we had a, a disconnect with the alignment prior to this year where each uh, system principal was aligned with a grade level. So we had a ninth grade principal, 10th grade principal, et cetera, and they followed the grade up. Counselors were aligned with their own caseloads really by families. And so at, and at any given moment, if you're a counselor and you have a family that may have three students in high school, right, at a time, you would then have three different assistant principals also assigned to your family and you take that combination and then you extrapolate that across eight counselors and four assistant principals and it's a whole lot of crossing paths, 
a ton of people that you have to connect with when you're trying to support students. One counselor, one moment, another counselor might have to get to another assistant principal, and it was not very efficient. So now what we've realigned is, is so that we've aligned assistant principal caseloads with counselor caseloads. So you do the math, it's really nice. We have eight counselors, we have four assistant principals. So each assistant principal is aligned now with the caseload of two counselors, and that creates a team of three and then that team will follow the students through and families through all four years or however many years that their family is there. And it creates incredible possibilities that we're just sort of cracking into now. Um, and so one possibility that's actually underway now I'd like to just highlight is um, what we're calling a CAPS meeting. So we've always had regular meetings every other week with counselors and administrators to identify students who might be struggling or at risk for some reason, initiate supports for them, and then monitor and track their progress. With the old alignment, what would have to happen is either everybody would have to be in the room at the same time for this meeting, in which case we don't need everybody all the time, or you'd have a small meeting and not the right people would be in the room. And we struggled with a couple of different models to make that work. Under the new alignment, two counselors, assistant principal, and then a school psychologist meet, and you have everybody in the room that you need every two weeks to track students, identify students, recommend implementations, and then follow up on them on an ongoing basis. So, so that is one of the ways that the realignment is supporting students in a way that that structure wasn't as effective before uh, the review and before that change. Okay, I'll turn it over to Rebecca for the next section. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, communication and accessibility. Um, so one of the recommendations coming out was um, to better help families understand how we support students at the high school. And we also wanted to look at how we ensure that each student has access to their school counselor throughout the school year. Um, so the first two bullets um, are things that we've always done, and they're important because they're the eighth graders' first experience in meeting high school counselors. Um, each January, we visit all of the 8th grade classes and we answer their questions about life at Greeley. We also share what the role of a um, high school counselor is. And while we give them very specific examples, I can tell you that broadly, we tell them that we're there to support their academic, social, and emotional lives um, at Greeley. Much like we do with the students, we also share this information with the eighth grade parents at the incoming freshman orientation evening meeting. Another specific recommendation that came out of this um, audit was to make the counseling website more robust so that we can really highlight the role of school counselors so that parents and students could be clear on, on the expectations for our relationship. So this is a snapshot. Um, of the website, and if you go on there, there's lots of additional information that can be found under FAQs. So this is really important to us, how do students meet with their counselor? One of the newer things that we do with students that actually came out of the pandemic is when we were trying to figure out ways to reconnect with our students after they return in the spring from remote instruction. So we offer counseling circles um, late in the spring so that we could talk to students about trans transitioning back to school. The students could voluntarily come to this and many came and they shared that there was great value in it so we actually decided to run them again in the fall. When reviewing our systems, um, we realized that we have very strong structures in place for meeting our ninth graders, beginning with our tours in August, and then very quickly into our individual meetings with them in the first few weeks of school. And certainly we have that as well with our juniors and our seniors. But what the review really highlighted for us was that we needed to add more focus um, to our 10th graders. And we're currently in the process of creating those new opportunities um, for the spring. Communicating changes in college admissions. So while this was not exactly part of the audit, one practice that I'd really like to highlight is our ongoing professional development work with our college admissions colleagues. Each fall we choose um, five or so colleges that our students often apply to and we invite them to come meet with us to do an application read with the eight counselors and administrators. 
We bring in applications with redacted names and we review two students that would have similar academic profiles to Greeley students. The admission counselor then walks us through what a committee read would look and feel like and we decide as a group which applicant is accepted and which is denied. We then compare our decision to what the college's real decision was and we talk about the why. These meetings are so important because it allows us to receive the most current and accurate information from the colleges that our seniors need to be aware of. Particularly in this time of COVID, when things have changed, it's really allowed us to communicate to our families a very fluid situation and they really do get the most up-to-date information from us. It's just sad to, I mean, some of what we've gone is, is like really, really talking about what's happening with test, test optional schools. And so you'll sit down with someone from the university and say, this college is, you know, still looking at tests. This one's test optional, this one's test blind. And actually goes through like in really granular depth the kind of changes that have happened just like in the last six months or in the last eight months so we have that information to share with families it's, it's really amazing i also would like to say that um what Grilly has also done is provide the opportunity for the central office to participate in these um, sessions so it helps us in our understanding of how we need to program forward to help support students be successful in a really competitive application process so i just want to thank rebecca for that she always makes sure that we're able to sit at the table and learn alongside with the guidance department. Um, another recommendation that's really important focused on supporting our special education students that may be transitioning to other opportunities and different pathways after graduation. So each month the counselors participate in training with Westchester ARC to gather information about community resources, family support services and other opportunities that we would include in writing a strong transition plan for our students. Some counselors also um, took part in an uh, indicator 13 audit of the transition portions of our students IEPs and in reviewing 40 plus IEPs we really gathered important data points that we're able to now incorporate into our best practices for students. In addition to providing evening meetings for parents and guardians of each grade level, we also run an evening meeting for special education parents, specifically to help them understand what support services are available at the college level and how they could access them. Last year, we invited a director of disability services to talk directly with the parents and to um, answer their questions. We then extend that discussion into very individualized meetings during the um, senior exit meetings, which we have for every senior that has an IEP. We celebrate their successes and we ask the student what supports they think um, they need to be successful in college. And then the team adds their thoughts as well. And then we come up with a plan of how to access those supports. supports. And so another, um category of the review focused on social emotional well-being of our students and a number of things that we've already mentioned to you um, and this, so this is at the center of the work right it's the center of, uh, of all the work that that the counseling department does um, and so some, some of the things we've already mentioned, mentioned like the uh, initiation of counseling circles really to help students who are transitioning back from um, from at-home instruction and online learning to in-person learning especially thinking about those 10th graders of this year who really had a ninth grade experience that for many of them was largely or sometimes in some cases completely remote coming in um, are rightly at the center of that. The CAPS is again that small group meeting to track students to identify, track and intervene with students um, who, who are struggling, right? And, and so that realignment of our system principals and counselors is really at the heart of SEL work. Uh, we have individual and group stu student meetings all the time. And some of these like the counseling circles are specifically designed to uh, address social emotional learning. But even our, you know, you take a look at any of the group meetings that we have, any of the junior group meetings around, for instance, uh, the college application process, SEL is at the heart of that and should be and really needs to be as well. So it's both the academic group meetings and the social emotional group meetings. Um, two of our counseling staff are right, right now trained as trainers in youth mental health first aid, which is really sort of like a, a base level training like you would have. Um, so regular first aid is not meant for medical professionals, but it's meant for someone who might come upon somebody who needs immediate assistance to stabilize and then get help that's uh, more professional and, and um, intensive help. So that is the same model for the youth mental health first aid 
training, and so they've been trained as trainers and now are going through a process of offering that training uh, over time to our faculty and staff. And then there's also work with professional organizations outside of Greeley, so Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorder and Four Winds um, Hospital. And while not um, specifically a recommendation from uh, the review, our DEI work is also at the center of our SEL work. It's at, it's, it's at completely at the center. The counseling department has undertaken some professional development training uh, this year. So one of the um, training sessions that they engage with is an implicit bias and awareness training through BOCES, uh, which they found tremendously helpful, and then also spoke to that to our department chairs. And we're now looking to schedule that to them. Um, there's also scheduled an upcoming uh, series seminar series on HBCU colleges. So to increase awareness, understanding, expertise for historically uh, black colleges and universities for our counseling department. And then there's ongoing work about our structures and systems. So one example here is just taking a look at and carefully reviewing like the, this is a college questionnaire that students answer as they're entering the college process to examine, take a look at, we haven't re revised it in a while, what unconscious biases might be there? Are we really centering all students? in the very document that we ask them to answer. And that's a review by the department, then also reviewed by director of DEI, staff developer of DEI. For example, like best practices about putting student questions that ask them to tell their stories first, it's just good practice for all students. But then even looking at a question that might ask a family to or a student to share whatever they might want to share about their family's uh, experiences with education, rather than asking a question that says something like, what college did your parents attend, which is loaded with assumptions and biases, but could be a hangover from previous years. So that's some of the day in and day out, like sort of detail work that's also happening within the department. So next steps, these are sort of maybe basic and obvious ones, but they're really important. One is we are, we are really thrilled about the realignment of the counselors and assistant principals. And like I said, that is a new change. And by the way, what's really interesting and fantastic about that, it's really no student impact or barely any student impact they might have changed an assistant principal. They didn't change their counselor. So, so um, they, they, they didn't come, come in and say, oh my goodness, this felt really, really different, different to the students. students. Maybe, Maybe some who had really close connections with an assistant principal had a little bit of an adjustment to make, but it felt really seamless. It wasn't a disruptive realignment. And we are just still exploring how building those new relationships, the systems and structures around that, and over time, as that team gets to know families better and better, we'll be uh, having great results from that. So let's continue to pay attention to that. We are also looking to revise and increase our communication with families regarding the schedule of family meetings. So the family meetings are available and uh, for, for all of our all of our families, the focus and the like sort of most of the uh, push out information and then follow up with families surrounds junior year. So one of the things we want to be doing is making sure that it's not uh, something that's on a website buried, but that we're more proactively making sure that families know they can come in and meet with their counselors and we have times of the year that's set up for different grade levels. Uh, so that they can take advantage of that and try to increase the frequency of those meetings. Or the, and then um, we're also going to, and this is ongoing work, continue to look for opportunities to meet with students, to continue to make and build those connections between counselor and student right from ninth grade all the way through 12th grade. That's where we're headed. Thank you. Any questions? That's I don't actually have any questions, but I just want to thank you both for a very thorough and informative presentation. It's exciting to see, um, you know, getting the report back and, and seeing where we could be stronger and then seeing you take that report and really make these changes. And they seem like really good and, and solid changes to help support our students and their families. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, the report that we got back was very interesting. I think they missed some, some of the uh, points that our, our counseling partner does very well. And I think they concentrated on some other issues, but that's okay. I'm glad you're taking that and using it as, as a guideline. But Rebecca, you, you mentioned COVID and the college application system and what's going on there. I know last year was probably sort of a little crazy time with everything. Can you tell us what's going on now with COVID and how, the, I mean, we don't have all the results yet for, for applications this year, but what you're seeing and how the, like, especially the juniors are doing and. Yeah, so thank you for asking that. Um, so. There's no question that the pandemic has affected all of our lives in every possible way, and that includes college admissions. I think what's been so important to our um, department and what we've been really focused on is communicating directly with the colleges 
Um, going out of our way to invite them in to do the application reads. It's been a great honor um, to have Dr. Ackerman at the reads. Um, and we've really been able to get the most um, up-to-date information about how colleges are reading applications um, now that they're test optional. And so, you know, we've heard a lot about um, that they're reading them in a more holistic way. They're looking for softer skills within the application. And um, I think it's just been so important to us to really um, get the most current information in a fluid environment and bring that directly to our, our students and families. Yeah, one of the most interesting things, I, and, and, and in some ways I think heartening, we heard from the director of admissions at Cornell was that it really matters, your essay really matters, how you write about yourself really matters, and how other people write about you really matters is one of the, one of the really strongest themes, and writing an authentic student voice. So how you write about yourself and what other people write about you. So get into the community, make, make sure you've made an impact, build relationships, and, and, so, and, and, and that's really, um, like I, I thought, a really uh, actually nice, nice piece of this. Great. Thank you very much. I also don't have a question, but um, I really appreciate how you took the recommendations and then built on that to go beyond and then add in what you thought was necessary to improve the department and the experiences for the families. And I think, I mean, it just shows, um, goes from the collaboration from your classrooms to faculty, staff, and families, community members together, how, you know, even with the consultants, we take these recommendations and we do these observations and we take it and we take it another step on another level, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have, I have um, comments and question, which is, I just want to start off by saying, with, uh, I so appreciate the thoughtful way that you went through the recommendations. Um, we, we've always had a terrific counseling department. I think a lot of parents are, are mystified and not sure how to approach it all the mm -hmm. time, and. I think uh, as a lot of parents go through the system, they get to high school and they think counseling and college admissions, and it, it's not about all about college admissions. So I appreciate that. I mean, and that wasn't what what our our audit was all about, but it's it's a factor. So I appreciate that you went through that and really are trying to make it, you know, user friendly and evolve as the students evolve. And and I cannot imagine the challenges that you faced during COVID, staying connected with all the students, and, and we so appreciate the efforts that you made. Um, I'm very happy to see the focus on SEL and making sure that you found a, a methodology that you could meet and identify students who were struggling and be there to assist them. And I think that, you know, I, all this is just great. So I, I'm very grateful and thankful. And, and the only question I have is, um, like, how, how difficult, easy was it to arrive at this? Because I think it's very hard to go through like there was always an assistant principal for grade level, et cetera, to sort of break it down and realize how can we really set up a brand new structure that like when we look at it now, it seems to make complete sense and it seems very easy, but it probably wasn't an easy process to get there and to come up with that. So I was wondering how lengthy a process that was. And um, I mean, it seems great and I hope that the results like find it easier to work with, but I'm wondering how difficult it was to sort of strip it down and build it back up again. Well, that's a great question. I'd say, <laughs> um, you, you know, moving there wasn't all that difficult, as I said, because we're, uh, you know, to, you know, the truth is we're not the first school to have done this, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that um, Adam Schoenbart has come from schools who have done this. I know, I believe, Adam Pease, I think both have come from schools that have done this. So the models are there. Mm -hmm. And I think there was sort of a mental barrier at first thinking, wow, are we gonna have to phase this in starting in ninth grade because it feels, and then there was this, of course, when you started really thinking through the process, you realized the disruption to students was minimal and that's mm -hmm. the thing you really worry about. On the other side of this, you're right, we dis did dismantle some structures and <laughs> around, around the, the, different, uh, the, the different responsibilities of assistant principals that were aligned with grade level. Right. And so we are still in the process of, of sure. on that back end, right. making sure that mm -hmm. we have reassigned and realigned but one nice thing actually coming out of that is um, in the old system, as assistant principals guided classes through graduation, a number of things, right? They would do it once, and then they would catch back up to it four years later. Yeah. 
And, and, and so that actually, while it spread the responsibility, it had an effect on creating expertise and repetition. So actually, the new system, as Realign, is actually going to have benefits on that end too, but that does take a little bit of work. I also would like to um, add that uh, it was through the budgeting process and the board support and ultimately the community deciding that we could add an additional assistant principal mm -hmm. to make this work. So mm -hmm. I do want to acknowledge yes. that and, and thank you for that. It was an investment that was well well served yeah. for Greeley. Do you find that, that the students are utilizing the counseling office more under the new structure? Well, I would say there's a, they're definitely using it a lot more than last year. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. So, COVID, COVID yeah. notwithstanding. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so we do have, so I don't have any metrics of, uh, right now about uh, use of the counseling uh, office now or like two years ago, and that actually is part of another recommendation, which is to build a, like an iPad kiosk, which which I think part of the idea was, you know, you might gain access that way. We don't think kids are going to have any more access. It might even be a little bit of a barrier. But part of the purpose was logging a uh, number of visitors. Right. So so we don't love the idea of a kiosk that students have to, it, it, it doesn't feel as welcoming and, and as easy. But we we would like to have the some data metrics about ga ga yeah. Yeah, ga gathering those me metrics. And, and, and so I don't I don't have those, but it is a busy place and students are always in there. Thank you for all the efforts. I mean, we can see all the work, and I, and I know that the students are really going to benefit from it. So thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, so I wasn't here for the initial um, presentation on the recommendations, but obviously you guys have taken what they recommended and run with it and put our own capital spin on it and really made something out of it that was useful and, and relevant. I have two questions. One is in the CAPS meeting. How are you identifying students? There's no teacher connectivity there. So if some if a student hasn't been coming into the, into the counseling center or a, a psychologist hasn't met with a student, how are you identifying someone who may be struggling without those touch points? That's, that's great. Do you want to take it? Sure, take it. Uh, yep. That's a great question. I mean, and part of part of the answer there. Is, is there's two ways of thinking about it. And, w and one is, what's the criteria for a student to arrive at that meeting, right? And that is intentionally open, because there are a lot of ways in which a student might be struggling, right? And, 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 and we don't want to limit it to academic struggles, attendance struggles, that sort of thing. But, uh, but a number of ways that will come through the individuals who are there, through counseling, through um, school psychologists, through assistant principal, but then through also some of the metrics that we track. And, and two of the most important ones around there are attendance and grades. Right? So if we do see a student who is really school avoidant and not coming in and having a major absence, that will have a student will, be, will bring up there. Mm -hmm. And likewise, at the end of a quarter, if we see students who are really struggling and in danger of failing, that also could be a metric that we would use to bring students up there. So it's both through contact and through teachers, but then also looking at those two. And, 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 it's, and it's very wide open because the, the ways in which students could enter into that system have to be wide open, right? Because we want to um, identify and, and, and support as many students as we can. And now my second one is a different end of the spectrum. Meeting with all these colleges, looking at the change in the way they're focused on standardized testing. SATs are responding, changing their testing, trying to cling on to their, their position in the world. Do you think that there may be an opportunity in the next three, five, ten years to re-examine our curriculum so that we're not stuck with teaching to those tests to expand or think about our curriculum differently where that isn't the holy grail. Or do you think that that's coming or are we still going to be stuck in this you know, funnel? I, I don't know that there's an answer to that. And, you know, maybe no, but Adam that sounds great, right? That sounds, <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that, sound, that sounds wonderful. Um, you know, I think that is something that, that we would want to be poised and ready to take advantage of as the wheel turns yeah. and um, the world shifts a bit. And so I think you have a lot of like-minded people here who are ready and prepared to take some steps. But at the same time, the, the, the movement is happening. There are a lot of students still taking tests. There are a lot of schools that are still using it as health optional. Yeah. It's changing rapidly now. And um, we'll have to see how that moves. I mean, the, the two, you know, two of the biggest factors for students with college admissions, a lot of the choices they make are earning the best grades they can and taking the most rigorous course schedule. And we could get into great talk about how that drives yep. curriculum instruction and all that, and that would be wonderful. But we, we, are, um, we don't have any answers now, but we are poised and ready and watching and ready to move. Hopeful. Yeah. 
So it's appropriate that it's National School Counseling Week. <laughs> yes. We're here tonight presenting on our counseling program. So thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Thank, thank you for yeah. having me. Thank you, Andrew. And I want to thank our assistant principals who are all yes. in the audience today. So yeah. thank you for being with us. And thank you for concluding our building presentations, um, Andrew, with your team. So have a, have a great evening. Really thank, thank you. you. This is great. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Um, that brings us to the president's report. Um, thank you, first of all, to our Greeley students who are long gone, and teachers and administrators for a wonderful presentation. And congratulations again to Anika Puri and Josiah Clarkson. Um, you're both exceptional and inspiring students, and we loved having everyone who came tonight join us. Um, I have some fun and interesting updates for you, but first let's talk about masks. As you may have seen, Governor Hochul is dropping the indoor mask mandate for businesses for vaccinated individuals. However, this does not impact the schools. There is still a mandate for schools for masks for now, so everyone in a school building must continue to be masked. This current mandate is set to expire over the February break. If there are changes to the law over break, those will be clearly communicated to our families. The governor has indicated that she is looking at whether or not to renew the mandate, but is concerned about the lower vaccination rate among children 5 to 11 in New York State. So if you haven't vaccinated your kids and you want the masks to come off, it's something to think about. As we said at our last meeting, we will continue to follow the law as we have since day one of this pandemic. We know that there might be some difficult conversations in some families around changes to the mask mandate, should that happen, but I want to address two points. As you can imagine, we've gotten a few emails on this since our last meeting. Some were thrilled, some less than thrilled. But there are two concerns that I do want to take a moment to address. First, picking on children for their mask choice will not be tolerated. We know that families have been making different choices through this whole pandemic, and it has been very hard on many kids to know that their friends have been living different lives from theirs. But within our schools, all families' choices will be respected. Second, once this mandate is relaxed, parents will have to communicate their expectations to their children. And I understand that there is concern that children will disobey their parents once they get to school. As parents, we empathize with this challenge, but as a school district, we cannot put this burden on our teachers. Moving on, I attended two interesting Zoom meetings since our last Board of Education meeting. The first was on electric school buses and helping school districts tap into a pool of money available to help school districts screen their fleet. This was organized and sponsored by Mothers Out Front and had a lot of really useful information. Um, in case anybody's unfamiliar with how busing works here, our district contracts with the bus company, Chappaqua Transportation. So they would have to do a lot of the legwork here as they own the buses, not the district, but this is something that we're going to discuss. And I got the materials from that webinar and have now disseminated them to the full board. So that's something that, that we're all gonna look at and, and explore. Um, it is more complicated of an undertaking than just let's buy electric buses because they need to charge and they need to be charged for the mileage to do all three runs in the AM and the PM. And there are a number of other logistical and monetary challenges, but obviously getting a greener bus fleet is something we should be working toward. And I appreciate the webinar and getting this information out to the school districts to be able to work with it. Um, I know that the town has up their commitment to charging stations for electric vehicles. So maybe there's some space for symbiosis here. We will continue to explore this from both a practical and a financial standpoint, but I wanted to update the community that this is something that I attended and something that we're gonna be looking at the information that came out from this webinar and, and, and sort of see where we are in terms of moving forward with that. The other meeting that I attended and Jane was also in attendance, if that's what you call being on a Zoom, um, was a legislative forum organized by West Putt, which is the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association. This excellent event allows school board members to hear from and ask questions of our New York State local elected officials. The conversation centered around three areas. The first, shockingly, was COVID. Um, the big ask of our elected officials was that if restrictions are not relaxed imminently, that metrics be provided for how and when they will be. Again, vaccination rates of children were mentioned. 
So there seems to be a theme here. And if your kids aren't vaccinated, please know that this seems to be front of everyone's mind as we move forward. The second topic was zero emissions buses and both increasing and aid for those and decreasing the logistics in terms of bringing those on board in terms of our fleets. So again, we're gonna be exploring that and moving forward. The third and lengthiest topic was financial, talking about the foundation aid formula and the challenges of the tax cap. On the foundation aid formula, there has been some talk of revisiting it. The message I got from this meeting was that while there is an acknowledgement that the foundation aid formula is out of date, there's also real concern that reopening it and attempting to rework it would actually harm districts in this area much more than help them. On the tax cap, which is of particular interest to all districts right now as we're developing budgets, again, there was a recognition that the tax cap poses a challenge, but other than a few voices, nobody is talking about trying to repeal it, only to maybe carve out some helpful fixes. Three suggestions uh, that uh, are apparently sort of out there in the ether um, were the ability to carry over unused tax le levy from one year to another year, especially recognizing that the tax cap increase isn't the same each year. A second suggestion was accounting for enrollment growth in cap calculations. And the third was implementing exceptions to, or exemptions rather, to the tax cap, such as exemptions for large pension increases. While that third idea would certainly the most, be the most helpful in crafting a budget, it also seems to be the most antithetical to the goal of the tax cap, whether or not one agrees with it. So it remains to be seen whether any of this goes anywhere, but I wanted to update everyone in the community on this meeting and what was raised with our local uh, elected officials and, and sort of the, the, the concerns and the suggestions that are put forth. Um, I will say, I my first year I got to go to this meeting in person and I missed this one being in person because it was much harder, I felt, to be engaged with um, the representatives on Zoom than in person, so hopefully the next one will be in person, but they certainly um, were responsive to the questions and the concerns, especially the frustration about the sort of lack of COVID off-ramps. So I think that that they heard board members speaking up and saying, you know, we need, we need some guidance here if this isn't imminently relaxed. Um, I know that the Chappaqua Schools Foundation ran another at-home cooking class this Monday. I was personally playing chauffeur at that time, so sadly couldn't attend. But everybody's photos look delicious, and I hope they will keep running these. Um, and the Horace Greeley Scholarship Fund and Share are running a bingo event next Tuesday that looks great, and you can still sign up. So we're lucky to have such wonderful organizations as part of our school community and hope that you will all support them. This is our last meeting before February break. I want to just finish by wishing everyone a wonderful, restful, restorative break, and hopefully the Staten Island groundhog will prove to be the more accurate rodent, and we will come back to an early spring. I personally am very ready for that. So that is the end of my president's report. Jane, I don't know if you wanted to say anything no, else. No, I think the... that was a great summary, and it was very helpful, um, that legislative forum, despite having to do it as a webinar, but it was great, and you summed it up very nicely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hillary, so we're going to move into the superintendent's report. Uh, okay, so we'll start with our vaccine information. So as you can see, uh, almost all of our buildings are above 80%. West Orchard is really close. You're at 79%, but it's, um, as I anticipated, we have more students um, being fully vaccinated as time presses on. So hopefully at our next meeting, we'll definitely be above 80% at our elementary schools and hopefully above the 90 mark in our middle schools. So thank you families for um, making choices that enable us to be more flexible with our program in the middle of this pandemic. You'll see uh, this week from Saturday to today, we have 15 cases in the district, 10 are on home tests, five are lab um, confirmed. And some buildings we don't, um, we've had maybe three cases, six cases, so the cases have significantly reduced. So our buildings are gonna transition back to the practices that we had in place prior to winter break. So we'll be moving um, our high school band back into the room out of the gym. We'll uh, out allow our students to move back um, in the elementary schools, working in small groups back on the, on the carpet. Um, we'll, we'll provide more flexibility while also being mindful of social distancing. Uh, let's just... Okay, so in terms of our testing information, hold on, I'm a, I'm a little, so we had uh, 45 
people test on Monday. We haven't, we didn't have any positives. That's significantly down from our testing experience in January, where we had well over a hundred people testing on Mondays. Um, we didn't have any of our, uh, we have barely any of our students who are not required to test come. And I think that's because we're now offering our home tests to families. So for our home test, we've had um, over 200 kits distributed. And if you were able to read my recent update, you'll know that on today, Thursday and Friday, any family can go to the security guard at their building and pick up tests for their kids. We'll be providing those for our families and they can use them as they, as they deem appropriate for their students. If uh, for some reason their child is symptomatic and they use both tests in a given kit, they can certainly uh, sign up through our website and we'll give them another kit. We have plenty available to support our families. We also distributed them to all of our staff, including our, our bus staff. So we are gonna make some adjustments to our procedures now moving forward that I'd like to share with the board tonight. And if you have any concerns, please let me know. Uh, the first, I've already shared this out with the community. The Department of Health made adjustments to test to stay. So now any student can participate in that program, including unvaccinated students who are in the home with a COVID positive individual provided they are able to isolate that positive person from the student who, um, is at risk for exposure. So now those students will be able to come to school. Initially, they had to quarantine and get medical clearance to come back in, which is a great shift for us. Um, we also make a, re a recommendation that we um, narrow individuals who are allowed to access remote instruction now to only staff and students who are COVID positive since everyone can participate in the home testing program if their children are symptomatic. Now it is true that students who are unvaccinated still at this point need to um, receive a negative test from a lab facility. They cannot use the home tests, but hopefully in, in the future that will shift. But since a majority of our students in this district are vaccinated, I do believe this is the best um, course of action for us to go in, um, direction for us to go in at this time, particularly since uh, remote instruction, although it may not seem to impact the class um, significantly from a parent's perspective, it absolutely does instructionally for our kids. So I think the more opportunities we can to reduce students learning remotely, we should take advantage of them. And now because we have um, a significant number of tests available for families to use to get their kids back into school when they believe they're symptomatic, we should exercise that opportunity. We will we'll keep the language in here that medically fragile students and unable to be vaccinated um, would have the opportunity to submit documentation for review to the district. We don't have any students in this category at this point. We could have someone move into district, so I would like to keep this in our plan just in case that would happen. Okay, so um, this, I had just shared with you, this is just some language around how we are uh, supporting families and picking up tests this week. If we distribute a lot of tests, we could continue this process into the future, but I, I wanna see where we are on Friday afternoon. Okay, so then another shift we're making in our practices is we're going to discontinue testing on Monday and move this completely to a home test program um, to uh, alleviate some, some burden on our staff for facilitating testing, also to be more flexible um, to our unvaccinated staff and students. Plus, uh, to be honest, we found a lot of our, um, our individuals who are, are testing are, have been, um, we're now exempt from testing because they fall within the um, a 90 day window of not being able, but not being required to test because of a positive result. So we just wanna be able to provide the maximum flexibility possible to be able to meet this requirement with an understanding that we have different resources today than we did at the beginning of the year and that the um, requirements around this have adjusted to relieve us, uh, relieve staff from testing and, and unvaccinated athletes who have already tested positive. And which you know, we had a lot of cases. So we have, do have some people that fit in those categories. Okay, so um, are there any questions about the COVID information? So I'll probably, I'm gonna put a notice out either Thursday or Friday, particularly with that remote information. So parents understand that and staff, and I'll update the continuity of learning plan. 
Um, I do wanna talk about our snow days. We've used four out of our five. If we um, use our fifth day, then we will start to transition to having remote instruction days. So um, we don't have to peel any days off of our breaks. Um, the way that we're thinking about moving forward with that, um, and this would be provided students have power, <laughs> they have Wi-Fi, um, we would operate on a two hour delay schedule so that we could assess the landscape to make sure that we could operate remotely. Um, we have to make sure not only our students can access our programs, but uh, our teachers are able to access our programs from their houses and that our principals have time to communicate with our families in case there's an issue. And, and I, would, I would project this out for families moving forward if we do use the fifth day in, in, the, in the near future. Hopefully that won't happen, but um, if that were to happen, then I would send out a communication that this would be the direction that we'll, we'll be going in. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, oh, all right. So I just wanna to mention to you on the agenda tonight is a follow-up from our meeting where um, we talked about our fellowships for next year. So of course our Wilson Fellowship is on here. Um, and that was noted as a strength in our special education audit. And we need to continue to support students, students, support our students through our staff being certified with level one um, Wilson intervention. And then um, we have our district equity team fellowship on this agenda for your consideration for approval. I wanna thank Miriam for supporting both of these two initiatives. And then um, I asked Jamie if she could talk about our next steps based on the PCG audit that uh, we'll share with you at our last meeting. So um, we were given a summary at our last meeting of the PCG audit, and we have already been unpacking the lengthy report, both in our department and sharing it with the, um, we did some work on it with the, P the special ed PTA today. And the things that we are doing immediately is we are looking to realign our RTI process. In fact, the new language is MTSS, which is a multi-tiered system of support. Um, we are planning to contract with a consultant who will work with a leadership team. And then that process will then be developed in turn key to all of the buildings. So we plan to have a consistent process in all of the buildings um, as a way of identifying students or having who are having difficulty with their learning so that we can intervene early and hopefully give them the support that they need to then no longer need those interventions and supports. Um, in addition to that, we, um, in the report, it mentioned that we needed to do some professional development on our IEP writing. And in particular, the report mentioned present level statements and goals so we have um, consultants coming from the inclusive group, which is a group we've used before. I don't know if you remember several years ago, we had a collaboration camp in the summer. The trainers were really good. Um, Karen and I met with them to talk about what our needs are. And on the superintendent's conference day on March 18th, they're gonna run two sessions, one for elementary and one for secondary special ed teachers and service providers on crafting those really important statements. Um, we are working to update the special education webpage. And we also, which is not up there, we recently distributed an annu annual review manual to all um, special ed teachers and service providers to hopefully lead to more consistency in some of our processes. So we didn't waste any time. We got started right away, but we are also really looking forward to some strategic planning that will begin soon with Jonathan Costa. And many of you know Jonathan Costa from when we did our strategic planning as a district. Um, we met with him, I guess it was yesterday or the day before, and he had a really thoughtful process and a quick process for us to go through to review the report, prioritize the recommendations, and then develop a, a three-year action plan. So we're looking forward to convening a committee um, to get that work done. Right, and his, um, 
target to present to the Board of Education will be June. Okay. And, and so I just want to end with a great picture of Matilda, which was performed by Seven Bridges uh, this past weekend. I want to thank the PTA. This is our first major event since COVID took place, and they did a fantastic job supporting our kids um, through the theater program. And it's not easy having an outside being an outside organization coming in and supporting a, a, such a robust program like this in the middle of COVID. So I just want to thank um, Peggy and her team for being able to support the, the, the shows here this year. And they did a great job. And this was our really our first one. So thank you for that. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to 1.2.1, um, which is the proposed calendar for the 2022-2023 school year. Um, I will move 1.2.1. Can I have a second? A second. Um, okay, I know that we wanted to discuss this calendar a little bit and sort of just discuss concerns around the calendar generally. And, and I want to start by acknowledging that we are lucky to live in, in a diverse school district where there are many families who celebrate, celebrate and observe a number of very different holidays. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. And it's a great opportunity for our kids to learn about their friends and to learn about traditions different from their own. And we have gotten some feedback and feedback that we absolutely want to take into account that the calendar as current doesn't necessarily reflect the diversity of our community in terms of the holidays which are given as days off from school and um, sort of elevated by that, that day off, if you will. So I want to acknowledge that Dr. Ackerman works incredibly hard on this calendar every year and that there are a number of challenges inherent to the calendar process, right? Yeah. There are union obligations. There are New York state laws on which days have to be off. There are mandates on how many days the kids actually have to be in school and uh, PD days. And there, there are a hundred moving pieces to this, mm -hmm. which is not to say that we aren't willing to look at it and, and really examine if there are things that can be moved or not moved. Um, I'm going to open it for conversation in, in, in a second. I think where we are is that we're looking to adopt this calendar as proposed for the upcoming school year, but are, as a board, very open to looking into whether there are changes that can potentially be made for subsequent mm -hmm. school years for a more inclusive calendar. Yeah, I would, I would just like to say uh, just a few things. There's certain days in the calendar we have to be off because we have to comply with New York State law, right? So January 1st, MLK Day, last Monday in May, first Monday in September, June 19th, Columbus Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Those have to be days off. There's no discretion there. Um, then we have 185 days that are in the CCT contract. And um, kids are required to be in 180 days, which is how we get five snow days. So then when you think about how you're kind of constructing the calendar from there, there's other days I need to place within the calendar and the way that um, school districts traditionally have moved forward is they try to place um, days off on days where they could anticipate low attendance, which is why we have Jewish holidays off in September since many of our families um, practice that particular religion. So it, it's, there, there are, um, there's flexibility in the breaks around when we take those breaks, but I try to put them in spaces where they um, tie with holidays to be more convenient for families. Um, there's flexibility in where we place some of our superintendent conference days. One really needs to be on election day because there's too much traffic here and it wouldn't be good for kids to have that level of traffic here while they're here. And the other one has to be before, one has to be before school starts because of our CCT contract. And then there's um, language around when kids can start school and when they need to end school. So this is, it's a, 
there's a lot that goes into calendar development, so it's not an easy process. So I just want to share that um, out loud so, so people can understand that while it may seem like a simple ask to add a day in a certain space, it has a bunch of layers to it that have a domino effect that need, to, that need serious consideration. And I think um, we, we have discussed that we think it's, it's always good to revisit this to make sure that all of our community members are represented and, and feel that their holidays and traditions are honored. And as the dynamic and makeup of our community changes over the years, and like we, we know that we haven't always had the same holidays now that we had 30 years ago in Chappaqua, et cetera. So there's always time to revisit it and it's important to us. And we want our community members to know that it is important to us. I think it, it would be premature for us to make a change right now after all of this work has been done on the calendar because as we said it's it's a precarious balance however knowing what we know you know the year ahead that we have to look at it and get some input but potentially from the community um, so that we make sure that the people's voices are heard and that's a process that that we're all willing to undertake and we think is very important so um, I think um, where we want to enact this calendar, given the work that has gone into it at this point, and again, where we landed, and know that this is something that we're happy to revisit and continue discussing moving forward. But this year in particular, there's not a lot of flexibility with this calendar. I mean, a couple days out of breaks, um, if, that's, if, if that's what we wanted to do. But I, again, I think what I'm hearing you say is that a process I think is important before I start making decisions like that, because that would have a significant impact on the community that have, there's a level of expectation of what this calendar is going to look like. Right. Like people expect a February break. They expect a break around um, either March or April. They expect a break um, at the, in, in, the, um, in December. Right. So, uh, you know, making significant adjustments to that, I think we'd have to, there'd have to be sig runway so people can provide feedback. We, we know right. that there have been years that um, there was one year I know that was a challenge that given where things landed and holidays landed and start of school again and contractual obligations and state obligations, we couldn't have a full February break or, you know, and that impacts people coming before or after Labor Day, that impacts people. Having a two-week break or not impacts people. And, and we know that because we've heard from the community and sometimes we can make a change and sometimes we absolutely can't. We're locked in based on other other factors and regulations. So um, I know I know a lot went into this this year, but again, every year is slightly different where everything lands. So this is something that we will revisit moving forward and try and get some more input on this. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we hear from we hear from different community different community members. I mean, some are, are happy that we have a longer Christmas break that, that, that the summer break. Others are not so happy because they need uh, child care. Child care. Mm -hmm. um, I think. As, as you said earlier, Christine, um, and, and James said this also, we we adjust our calendar over time. We can't, and we can make immediate adjustments. We've done that this year already for a day or two. Um, and I would love to see this get, get revisited early next year or even late this year in the summer so we can start looking at where we're going with this for the, for the following year's calendar. Um, to, to make ma major changes right now, I think would be very difficult. Um, but I think it's something we really have to take a look at. Again, we, we have changing dynamics in our community, and we should be uh, looking at that as, as school board and administration. We have to un understand that we're doing what's right for our whole community. And, uh, yeah, yeah, the feedback this year was about adding Lunar New Year. Right. I mean, we only that, that's what uh, other years. It's been different feedback about right. different holidays. Right. We, we get, we get, we get different morning. feedback every year. But I think it's it's something we have to continue to take a look at, and I think we should go forward with this calendar. I think you've got does a good, very good job on it. But it's something we really have to take a look at in, in the future going forward, and saying, can we can we maybe make some adjustments with maybe superintendents' days or adjust around this and figure out where we go. But yeah. thank you, Christine, and the administration for working hard on this, and let's keep moving on. I also feel good about adopting this calendar tonight because this is the calendar that was put forward to the community and that they have had an opportunity to provide comment on. So I wouldn't want to make changes at this time. But I think, you know, if we can over, you know, the coming months, because the holidays fall on different days, but they are what they are, 
solicit some feedback from the community and, and some input and try to have that information sort of at our disposal earlier in the process, I think that that would be helpful, if not for this coming school year, then, then subsequent school years. So can I add on to this? Um, so I think we all understand that whether it's one family that write in or one or two families that call a specific board member, that everybody has expectations. Christine, I know you just said people expect certain days off, certain weeks off, um, look forward to certain vacation plans that they have been thinking about, especially nowadays where people haven't been able to travel for so long. You know, these are the things that we look forward to. But I think we also need to acknowledge that, you know, this is my first year on the board, but at the same time, this is not a discussion or a topic that's come up um, for exploration for the first time. And each time it could be a different holiday, it could be Lunar New Year, Chinese New Year, it can be Diwali, it can be Eid, it can be all sorts of holidays that I might not be even aware of. And we understand that and recognize that, but I think it's important that we do seriously start this conversation, which we have, and look at the school calendar in a way that is, you know, like all my other colleagues have said, representative of what our community looks like right now. What does our student population look like? Um, and I don't think anybody thinks this is an easy process. We understand, I understand that it's difficult and we have mandates and laws that we need to um, follow, but it's not completely impossible. I think if we can get creative, which we've been known to do and be, um, and tr try to, you know, you use the phrase maximum flexibility possible, but being able to do that with the calendar and what is important to families that live here, um, I think is really, really important. And I appreciate the work that goes around this because you know, it's not always just the majority, right? We have to think about, I think, everyone. And um, the fact that it's, it's been up for discussion, but things haven't happened. Like you said, you, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we might not had, you know, the need or the want. And, you know, families are conflicting over these days and do we pull the children out and do we not and maybe some families do but some family families decide we're not because the child is hesitant to miss a day of school because of the work that they have to make up or if they're in higher level schooling it's it's just hard if you're in high school right to miss that one day um, so I, I do think that talking about this and um, you know, unfortunately, maybe not for this coming school year, but for the, definitely for the next, and depending on, because the difficulty of these lunar calendars in all of these different countries, it changes every year. So some year it's gonna be on a weekend, so we don't have to. Um, but I, I do think there's room to be flexible and creative around the calendar. Okay, uh, so do you mind I'm actually thrilled that we're having this conversation. I have a very long lens into Chappaqua schools. I grew up here um, when the calendar didn't look like this and it evolved because the community wanted it to evolve. And I think that keeping an open mind and being aware that our demographics keep changing, um, that we want to be, we want diversity, equity, and inclusion to show in our calendar as well. And so, I understand all of the complications and this is a thankless job putting this calendar together. So I applaud you for, for getting what we have here because it does work for next year, but I do think it's a great conversation to have and to really look at um, thinking through what, what works best for the community. So I'm excited that we're having this conversation. Well, thank you all for a productive conversation, I think on this and we'll continue to keep the community informed as we move forward on, on hopefully, you know, collecting data. I'm not sure what that'll look like, but we'll figure it out. Um, 
I think the most appropriate time would be next fall when the new K families are in sure. to collect information. I just have to figure out the best way to do it. So we, we have some time. Okay, great. But for now, all in favor of 1.2.1, which is the adoption of the 2022-2023 calendar as presented, please say aye. 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 Okay. Um, committee reports. I have none. I have none. I don't have any. Love it. <laughs> yes. Um, that brings us to the public comment period. We welcome public comment and respect for each other's time. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Board members may be contacted via email or via phone. After the public comment period has been completed, board members may have a discussion amongst themselves regarding the comments presented. So if you'd like you're up. Um, I just, I'm Peggy McKetto. I'm the president of the Chapel PTA. And um, uh, Dr. Ackerman was so nice to mention our uh, theater production, but um, even larger than that, I just wanted to thank all of the building administrators, um, the principals, um, and uh, Dr. Ackerman for supporting the relaunch of a lot of PTA extracurricular activities. We have after school enrichment running in the elementary schools. Um, we just did Matilda. You can get excited for Legally Blonde happening with Belle. Um, and Science Olympiad is also doing some activities over the weekend. And it's really been wonderful to engage in dialogue back and forth of um, how can we make these things happen for students. And um, I appreciate the way that Dr. Ackerman has been very creative and thoughtful with us. We moved our STEM Fest uh, to a, a little later in the spring so it can be outdoors. And there's just really been um, a way to try to meet everybody's needs that I know we really, um, it was so much just to get schools open, but even adding these programs um, still this during this time is really, really meaningful to a lot of families. So I appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to say uh, thank you to Jamie Edelman. Um, she, our special ed families have been very appreciative of her time and, um, and the next level of implementing the recommendations and um, suggestions from the outside consultant. I know that uh, it's been really important to those families to, to see real change and it's going to you know, be a long process, but Jamie has been really good about communicating effectively with them and being very open with her time and generous with her time. So I wanted to say that. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, the, about the holidays. Um, it is, the calendar is incredibly difficult and I definitely understand that. But I will say from our membership that the diversity of the PTA and our families they have raised this issue. No one's coming to the table with like an amazing solution that I can offer you, but I just wanted to add to the debate that um, there are many families who, um, who see this as an area for improvement. And I wish I had the answer for you, but I just wanted you to know that it, it is more than a couple of families. Okay. Thank you. Right, I recommend um, 3.1. Oh wait, sorry, I'm like on the wrong spot. Sorry. You got overexcited. Yeah. All right, so if there are no more public comments, um, we will turn to approvals and ratifications. So can I have a motion please for 3.1, which so, is accepting the minutes of the January 26th meeting. I move 3.1. I'll second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Okay, let me try that again. I recommend 4.1 instructional as presented. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'll move 4.1. I'll second. Questions, concerns? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I recommend 4.2 non-instructional as presented. I move 4.2. I will second. Any questions or concerns? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that brings us to the consent agenda. Uh, use of a consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting in a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. 
Any member of the board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate and that item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all board members to be heard on any issue. Um, so my first question is to the board, does anybody want to remove anything under the consent agenda from the consent agenda? Okay. No. Um, then I will move the consent agenda, which is items 5.1 through 5.10. I'll second. Um, does anybody have any questions or concerns? We are uh, approving CSE summaries, a um, couple of bid awards and purchase orders, all fairly routine. Yes, the voting stuff so that we can have an election come May, which seems very far off and will be here before we know it. Um, and an SMOA with the CCT. Uh, questions or concerns? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, um, that brings us to six, which is acknowledging contracts, which have already been approved by the superintendent pursuant to board policy 6085. So can I have a motion, please, for items 6.1 through 6.4? I move 6.1 through 6.4. I'll second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, and under seven, we are acknowledging two change orders. Again, they've previously been approved by the superintendent um, per board resolution at a 2017 Board of Education meeting. So this is item 7.1 and 7.2. I will move 7.1 and 7.2. Second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, there's nothing under eight, which brings us to notice of future meetings. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, March 2nd uh, at 7.30, where we will receive the superintendent's budget proposal. It's always a fun meeting. You should come. Uh, we'll be back here. And then our meeting after that is Tuesday, March 15th. Uh, also here, where we will get the curriculum and technology, the special education, and the athletic budget presentation. So can I have a motion, please, to adjourn our meeting at 9.39 p.m.? I move. Second. All in favor? All right. We are adjourned.